everyone, welcome to another video for the Valley Podcast. Today I'm live with Professor Yonatan Adler, and we're talking about his book, The Origins of Judaism, an Archaeological Historical Reappraisal. For those that are unfamiliar with him, Professor Yonatan Adler is an Associate Professor in Archaeology at Ariel University in Israel, where he also heads the Institute of Archaeology. In 2019 to 2020, he held the appointment of Horace W. Goldsmith, Visiting Associate Professor in Judaic Studies at Yale University. Adler specializes in the origins of Judaism as a system of ritual practices and in the evolution of these practices over the long term. His research in recent years has focused on ritual purity observance evidenced in the archaeological remains of chalk vessels and immersion pools. He has also researched and published extensively on ancient Teflon phylacteries from Qumran and elsewhere in the Judean desert. Welcome to the podcast, Professor Adler. Thanks so much for having me, Jacob. Well, I want to kick off with this uh, question. When you're when you're saying that you're reappraising the archaeology in Israel, what are the implications of that? What what led you to that um, to that route? What led you down that path? Okay, so the the title of the book is The Origins of Judaism, an Archaeological Historical Reappraisal. And what I'm doing in the book is looking at the question of when Judaism uh, begins, when Judaism first emerges on, on the stage of history. Now, we need to begin with definitions. When I say Judaism, what exactly is it that I'm, I'm referring to? So I'm not going to define what Judaism is, but what I would like to do is define what Judaism is for me for the purposes of this, this book. What I'm looking at is the question of from which period of time did the Judeans, the ancestors of today's Jews, first began, begin to keep the laws of the Torah in daily life? So the question is Judeans as a society. I'm not looking at, so off the bat, right, I want to already say, I'm not looking at the question of from when do we have the Torah, from when does the Torah exist as a, as, as a book, because this could go back far earlier than the period of time when Judeans as a society know of this Torah, right? So we, I think we can assume that the Torah was written down, edited, and so on and so forth way earlier or at least earlier, let's put it that way, earlier than when Judeans at large came to know of this Torah, to regard it as authoritative and to put it into practice. So the question that I'm looking at in the book is, when did Judeans as a society, ordinary Judeans, your farmers, your craftsmen, your homemakers, the ordinary people, when did they come to know about the Torah and put it into practice? That's, that's the question that I'm asking in this book. What would you say is the earliest evidence that we have that attest to the existence of the early, the, the, the earliest evidence for Jewish practices, basically? Okay, so precisely that's the question that I'm asking. Um, and I'll, I'll get to the answer to that question. But first, I'd like to uh, explain what my methodology is. So the methodology is actually quite straightforward. I start from a period of time when we know that this thing that I'm calling Judaism existed. A period of time when we have ample evidence that ancient Jews, let's call them for, the, for our purposes Judeans, were knew of the laws of the Torah and were keeping it. And throughout the book, I show that in the first century of the common era, we have a plethora of evidence, both textual and archeological, which indicate that um, th th that ordinary Judeans were knew about the rules of the Torah and were keeping them. I don't, I don't know if I would say universally, but certainly in a very, very widespread manner. Um, so, you know, chapter after chapter, I show the various practices, things like uh, the Sabbath prohibitions, um, fasting on the Day of Atonement on Yom Kippur, the laws of Passover, right, refraining from eating leaven, uh, eating unleavened bread, 
um, the dietary laws, right? Refraining from eating things like pig and, uh, and scaleless and finless fish. Um, the purity laws, the figural art, these are all practices and prohibitions which we have ample evidence of in the first century of the common era that Judeans are practicing. What I then do is then I look backwards in time. I go backwards to the first century before the common era, to the second century before the common era, to the third century before the common era, looking for evidence that ordinary Judeans were keeping these rules. And what I find, and this is where I'm getting to the, cutting to the chase to answer your question, what I find throughout the book is that the trail of evidence ends invariably in the middle of the second century before the common era. So the middle of the sec second century before the common era, this is the Hasmonean period, the period when Judea is ruled by an independent uh, Judean family called uh, the, the Hasmoneans after the Maccabean revolt. It's at this time that we have the first evidence that ordinary Judeans are keeping the rules of the Torah on a wide scale basis. Would it be fair to say from the evidence that you've examined that Judaism and its religious practices developed in stages over time? Um, okay, so when we're, going, when we're dealing with archeological time, when we're dealing in, in the ancient past, um, I think it's important to remember that our scale is a bit different than what we, what we think of today, right? So, so for us today, if we were to talk about some, uh, some phenomenon developing over the course of 50 years, right? That's a long time, right? What was 50 years ago uh, today? Today we're in 2023, so 50 years ago was 1973. Um, that was a long time ago. So think of some kind of cultural phenomenon that developed over the course of the last 50 years. We would think of that as a long time. In archaeological terms, that wouldn't be considered a long time. Um, so it's, when, I'm using a quite a broad brush when I speak the middle of the second century before the common era, right? The middle of the second century before the common era is the course of a couple of decades. Um, the earliest evidence that we have comes from around that period of time. Now, what I do in the book, and I'm very, very careful about my, my um, analysis of the data here. The fact that the earliest evidence that we have that, that has survived comes from the middle of the second century before the common era is a fact. Uh, if you'd like to debate me on that, you, you can do that. You can debate me and you can bring me evidence that comes from an earlier period of time. I don't know of any earlier evidence. If one of our uh, listeners, someone watching out there knows of evidence which predates the second century before the common era, please let me know. As far as my research has shown, there is no surviving evidence. Now, tomorrow we might find new evidence. That's always possible. But to date, there is no surviving evidence known which predates the middle of the second century before the common era. What does that tell us? That gives us, that doesn't mean that Judaism emerged in the middle of the second century before the common era necessarily. What it means is that we have a terminus antiquem. That means that Judaism must have emerged, must have appeared then, in the middle of the second century before the common era, or earlier. Because it's always possible that evidence hasn't survived, that the evidence is there. Pe people were keeping the rules on a wide scale basis, but the evidence simply hasn't survived. That's always a possibility. Um, Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. That's, that's something which is very important to remember. So what I'm able to do is determine very clearly a terminus antiquem. What I do in the last chapter is I look beyond that terminus antiquem. I look in periods prior to the second century before the common era to look for more contextual evidence, more, um, I would say, evidence which uh, which deals with the Sitzenleben, the, 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 the place uh, within which uh, Judeans were living, you know, a place, I mean, in, in terms of time and in terms of surroundings and, and uh, circumstances, 
to search for what makes the most sense in terms of seeking the, the, the beginnings of Judaism. So in other words, um, by definition, prior to our Terminus Antipem, we have zero evidence, zero surviving evidence that Judeans are keeping the rules. But possibly that evidence hasn't survived and therefore we should, we should look at circumstantial evidence to see, okay, um, you know, what was going on at the time? What do we know that Judeans were doing? And does that look like anything like uh, what, what we would imagine uh, Judaism uh, would look like? So you know, I assume that we'll, we'll, we'll get into the, the details a little bit more as we discuss this, but basically that's, that's the overall uh, outline of the book. I, I have the data-driven analysis in the first six chapters, right, where I look at practice after practice. I start with the first century of the common era, go backwards in time, showing that the ev trail of evidence ends in the middle of the second century BCE. And then in the last chapter, I look at circumstantial evidence before the second century BCE to see, you know, to try to conjecture essentially when, when Judaism must have emerged and, and why. That's that, that, that's the basic outline of the book. I remember that you mentioned in the book that you think it's possible that there might have been a proto-Pentateuch, as you call it. And I want to ask in relation to that question, to that possibility, because I know you also, you bring up Hilkiah, you bring up Ezra. We both know that in the Old Testament, Hilkiah supposedly discovered some kind of law code during a renovation uh during a renovation of the first temple um and then later on supposedly ezra released copies of his law and what i want to ask you about is do, how reliable do you think those accounts are and could the hypothet the hypothetical proto pentateuch in your opinion be possibly connected to either one of those accounts? What are your thoughts on that? Okay, so number one, I wanna make very clear that in my book, I distinguish between what I call intellectual history and social history. Intellectual history is what biblical scholars usually spend most of their time doing. Okay, biblical scholars are super interested in the ideas that we find in uh, in biblical literature. You use the word reliable, okay? Um, we need to be very careful when we're speaking about any writings, historical writings, ancient writings, uh, certainly, what, we, what kind of evidence we can uh, expect to be able to extract from, 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 from writings, from texts. Texts and biblical texts included are a wonderful source of historical data if our interest is in the history of ideas, if our interest is in intellectual history. What, what do I mean by that? If we read a biblical text, it doesn't matter what biblical text we're talking about. It could be Genesis, it could be Proverbs, it could be Song of Songs, it doesn't matter. Or the New Testament for that matter, you know, the gospel text, whatever. A text written by a human being in the past. This is a wonderful source of historical information about the ideas that were in the writer's mind that that writer wanted to express in words, right? So if we can figure out when this writer lived, we have wonderful information about a single writer for any particular text writing at that particular point in time. And we have a notion of the ideas that were in that person's mind that he want he or she possibly wanted to 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 express um, uh, in literature. That's great if we're interested in the history of ideas. If we're interested in social history, in other words, in what the people surrounding this writer were thinking, were doing. If we're interested in political history and in, in you know, any kind of economic history, any other kind of history, aside from the history of ideas, then we run into some trouble, right? Because the biblical texts, again, any text that's written by human beings 
in the past, in other words, before right now, which is all the texts that we have, they're penned by human beings who are subjective. So they have, first of all, everything that they, that, that, that they are writing comes through their brains, which experience the world through their, their ears and their eyes and, and all of their senses, right? These are texts which are written by humans who are subjective. And therefore, to try to uh, decipher from them what was actually going on, uh, we need to be very careful. So, so, so uh, th there's no such thing as a reliable text, period, full stop, right? We, we don't use, I don't like to use the term reliable when we're talking about uh, history, right? When we're talking about relying on, you know, some textual source, whatever that textual source is. I, I don't think that that's, a, that's an appropriate term. I think that these texts are excellent sources for intellectual history. So getting, that, that was all an introduction to answer your question. Uh, in terms of Pentateuch, Proto-Pentateuch, and so on and so forth, I actually don't, I might have mentioned this in the book, but I don't get into this because I'm not doing intellectual history. I'm doing social history. What interests me, and this is perhaps what sets my book apart from uh, what biblical scholars generally do, I'm interested in what the ordinary people are doing. I'm not interested in terms of, as far as the book is concerned, I'm not interested in the biblical writers as such. I'm not interested in what they're thinking, what they're thinking people should be doing, what they're telling us people were doing. That doesn't interest me in this book. What interests me is what people were actually doing. When were Judeans actually keeping the laws of the Torah? Now, we have the, the stories that you mentioned um, in terms of Josiah, uh, Ezra, Hezekiah, also, you know, dis discovering uh, uh, laws that are, that are in the Torah and, and, and promulgating them and so on and so forth. These are stories that the biblical writers tell us and from these stories, we can learn that the writers of these texts clearly thought that the Torah was something important, something which Judeans should be keeping. Absolutely. And that's important. But for my purposes, it's not particularly important because my question is, were the Judeans actually aware of this Torah? Were they putting it into practice? And the stories themselves cannot really tell us that. We've got a super chat question. Michael Apple, thank you for your super chat. Given Dr. Adler's research, give some differences between Jewish worship in Judea, late Second Temple, and the diaspora. Are there real differences in the social history? Okay, that's an extra, uh, excellent question, Michael. Um, so it's a little bit hard to say because our data is not so, um, I, I would say it's not so thick. Uh, in, in terms of uh, differences, there's little doubt that there would have been differences. I, it makes sense that there would be differences between different geographical areas. Um, we have evidence that, Ju that Judeans in the diaspora are keeping things like Shabbat, are refraining from eating pig. So for example, in, Jews in, in, in Egypt, Judeans in Egypt, uh, are, we are told that they, that they refrain from eating pig um, we have synagogues in, in Egypt where Judeans are gathering once a week to hear the, the Torah being read. And we also find in, 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 in the New Testament, in, especially in Acts, uh, stories about synagogues in uh, the diaspora, especially in the area of Asia Minor, Turkey of today, where the Torah was being read on a weekly basis before, again, ordinary people. So whereas most people probably would have been illiterate, all you needed is for one person in the community to know how to read and for there to be one scroll of the Torah in that community and a building where people could gather once a week and, and you would have the Torah being spread. So to the degree that the Torah was the same in, in, in all these different places, and I think there's good reason to think that was the case, uh, it would make sense that more or less you would have 
more or less the same uh, observances. When I say more or less, that means so you know people are keeping are, are are observing prohibitions on the Sabbath, exactly what those prohibitions were. Doubtless there would have been uh, disagreements about, uh, but the fact that they're observing some kind of prohibitions on on Sabbath uh, is clear. The same as far as you know abstaining from the things that are prohibited in, in the Pentateuch. There probably were differences in how exactly this was interpreted, but the, the basic rules, uh, I think, were probably kept both in the diaspora and in Judea. I want to discuss the elephantine papyri for a moment. Um, is it really evidence, early evidence of the Passover being practiced or something similar to it? Because uh, I know you talk about that as well a little bit. Yeah. Um, sure. Just want to get your quick thoughts on that. Yeah, sure. Okay, so the Elephantine papyri, uh, papyri are super important for understanding Judean society uh, in, let's say, the 5th century before the Common Era. That's when, when these uh, date to. Some of them have actually excellent dates uh, in, in, in the documents themselves. These come from, just for the, the listeners uh, who, who perhaps aren't familiar, Elephantine is an island in southern Egypt, so it's called Upper Egypt, Upper Nile, uh, near Aswan of today. And uh, there was a Judean settlement, so a settlement of Judeans self-identifying as Judeans living on this island in the Nile River in the 5th century before the Common Era, so the 400s. Uh, before the Common Era. And because this is Egypt, it's an arid country, we have preserved papyri, which usually you know, would, wouldn't have been preserved under normal circumstances because it's such a dry area, these have been preserved. We also have ostraca. These are documents written on broken pottery shards, which is, also have been found. And not all of them belong to Judeans, but a large collection do belong to Judeans. And what we find is that there's no evidence in these documents of uh, that, that the Judeans living in the fifth century before the Common Era knew anything of the Torah. Okay, and the one one document which scholars tend to cite that s seems to have something to do with the Torah is the so-called Passover letter. This is a letter which speaks about something happening uh, on the 14th day of a certain month. And from the back of the papyrus, it seems the continuation of the letter, it seems that that month is probably Nisan, which is the, the first month of, uh, of the year. Uh, and something happening between for, for seven days between the 15th and the 21st of, of, of this month which seems to coincide with the Festival of Unleavened Bread. And supposedly, the letter also talks about eating Passover sacrifice and refraining from eating leaven, uh, eating unleavened bread, purifying before, uh, before this holiday, and so on and so forth. This sounds a lot like uh, the Passover and the Festival of Unleavened Bread that we find in the Pentateuch. What I show in the book is a major problem with this understanding is that all of the parts of the letter which speak about Passover, eating unleavened bread, and so on and so forth, all the stuff that really looks like what we find in the Pentateuch is all reconstructed. Right? So this, this, this papyrus is extremely fragmentary. There's only uh, the, the, the upper part of it and the left hand part of it has survived the right hand part on the on the front of the papyrus is almost completely missing and it's there in that missing part that we have all the stuff that's really parallel to uh to passover now to do that right just to, to say okay so we're going to reconstruct this letter and then use it as evidence that judeans were keeping the rules of the torah is what we call uh, in logic circular reasoning, right? And just in case reader, you know, the listeners here aren't aren't aware of this, circular reasoning is bad. 
right? We, we try to avoid circular reasoning because it's bad reasoning. So I'm not saying that we can't try to reconstruct this letter. It's fine to, 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 to try to reconstruct the letter. But if we assume that the writers of the letter knew about the Torah and reconstruct the letter on that basis, we can't go then 180 degrees and and reason, okay, they must have known about the Torah because here, you know, it, it talks all about Passover just like it says in, in, in the Pentateuch. So the, 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 the so-called Passover letter uh, is actually nothing of the sort. It's, it's not a letter which speaks about uh, Passover. The one word in this letter which, which ha has been preserved, which scholars think has something to do with, with, with uh, the Festival of Unleavened Bread, is the word in Aramaic, chamir. And the word chamir, uh, act, it, scholars have, have translated this to mean le uh, leaven, right? But in actuality, it means fermented. And that line, the, the preserved line, speaks about drinking something um, and, and, and anything which is fermented, which is hamir, right? So in later Aramaic, the, the, the word hamir is come, has come to be, to be used for fermented dough, which is leaven. But because the line is speaking about drinking or not drinking, I, I think the, the, the most uh, straightforward translation would be fermented. Either drink something fermented, don't drink something fermented. The Pentateuchal rules about the festival of unleavened bread, Passover, say nothing about drinking anything. There's nothing drink to, to drink or not to drink, nothing about anything, any fermented drink. So the connection to Passover or to the festival of unleavened bread at most is has something to do with the dates. So if, if indeed the dates are from the 15th until the 21st of the, uh, of the month of Nisan, then we would have a, a, a parallel in terms of, of you know, the, the festival that we find in the Pentateuch. That's not a reason to assume that the writer of this letter knew about the Pentateuch. Assuming that the Pentateuch did exist earlier, and I know that in the book you, you're not specifically taking a position on when it, on when it dates, but if you, had, if you had to lean a certain direction... Oh. When do you think the Pentateuch was circulating alongside these uh, these early Jewish practices? So again, if the question is when did it exist, uh, and you were to say, and you were to ask me, you know, when did the pen, when was the Pentateuch written? When was it uh, edited? Uh, and you were to ask me if I had to, you know, lean in one direction or another, I would say, what's forcing me to lean in one direction or another? I don't know. I don't know. Um, I know that scholars have been debating this for, you know, what is it, 200 years or so. Uh, and I, I think the evidence that we have, that I've seen, uh, is is not very good. So it's really, really hard to, to stake a claim, uh, you know, any in, in any particular century, when the Pentateuch came to be, uh, the various parts of the Pentateuch, let's say, uh, came to be written down, when they came to be edited. Super complicated uh, subject, and the jury is still out on this. So I'm certainly not going to, to weigh in on, on, on this question. And as I said, in the book, I don't weigh in on this question, because as far as I'm concerned, the Pentateuch could be much older than the Hasmonean period when the earliest evidence we have for the widespread observance of this Pentateuch first appears. So, so, so these are two really, really different things. And I, I simply don't touch on the question of when uh, the Pentateuch or its sources were written down, edited, and so on and so forth. I think it's important to, 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 to understand and to, to recognize this for, for your audience um, to, I assume that there are a lot of non-specialists, but specialists also, I think, oftentimes forget this. For us, the biblical texts are the Bible. 
right? These, these are important, important texts for, let's say, Western civilization, right? And they have been for quite some time. What we forget oftentimes, and I think biblical scholars are, are guilty of this just as much as, as laymen, what we forget is that when these texts were first written, we have little reason to think that ordinary people knew about them or cared about them, right? The, the authors of these texts, biblical, biblical scholars often speak of the, the authors of these texts as elites, right? Societal elites. If you look in the dictionary, the, the English dictionary, the term elite assumes or suggests that these people have some kind of influence on society. And I have little reason to think that the biblical authors were elites. Certainly they were highly intelligent people. These were intellectuals. These were people that were highly literate and capable of penning extraordinarily complex literature, right? Absolutely. That doesn't make them elites. That doesn't make them at all influential. So we have to remember this when we're thinking about these biblical texts, that after they were written, they might have been not even circulating at all, right? These texts, or at least some of them, might have been sitting on a shelf somewhere, gathering dust. That's certainly a possibility. Another possibility is that they were being circulated amongst a very small cadre of other intellectuals, right? Uh, scribes uh, and so forth, who were not, again, not elites. And, you know, I can imagine, it's very easy to imagine a small, a small circle of, of pietists, of, 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 of scribes that are passing these texts around uh, amongst themselves. But we're talking about, a, or we could be, right? Potentially, we could be speaking about a very small group of individuals that are uh, that know about these texts and are regarding them as as important to, in, in any sort sort of way. That's a possibility which we need to keep in mind. And what I'm looking at in the book is okay. What evidence? When when do we have evidence that that the Pentateuch went beyond this small group of people? If there if there was such a group of people. When do we have evidence that the masses, the ordinary people, the rank and file Judeans as a society came to know about the Pentateuch and to regard this as a, a, a as a text which is, has, is authoritative and which they need to put into practice? Eventually this happened, right? When we get to the first century of the Common Era, that for sure, that is the case. And what I show in the book is that this actually, the earliest evidence we have for this is in the Hasmonean period, in, in the middle of the second century before the common era. From the archaeological evidence that you've, that, that you've seen, um, do you see, when do you see the earliest evidence of monotheism having occurred with, with certainty in contrast to polytheism? And even when monotheism started emerging, where there's still a lot of Jews, from what you can tell, a lot of Jews of that time, practicing the, uh, the worship of more than one deity. Okay, so so one of the things that I, I show in the book, in the last chapter that I, I mentioned, that where I look beyond the um, the terminus antiquem that I that established in the second century before the Common Era, um, I look at the Persian period. Okay, so we're talking about let's say the sixth. The, the late sixth century until the late fourth century before the common era. This is a period of time where we have evidence. You mentioned Elephantine. We have evidence from Judea. We also have evidence from Babylonia. These are the three geographical locations where we have surviving evidence of Judeans living during this, this Persian period. And actually at each of these locations, we have evidence that Judeans worshipped the Judean God, okay, um, Yahweh, but we also have evidence at each of these locations that the Judeans revered in some way or form. I'll, I'll keep that term very uh, vague because exactly what, what the beliefs were is hard to say, but I'll tell you what the evidence is in a second. 
uh, at least revered other gods aside from, 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 from the Judean god. So for example, uh, let's start with Elephantine where we have the most evidence. At Elephantine, we have Judeans that build a temple to the god, they call him Yaho, right? yud hei vav but alongside this temple to the god Yaho, they are collecting monies for Yaho and for other deities as well. Um, so for example, we have, uh, they're collecting money, monies as donations for Anat Yahu, right? This seems to be some kind of a female consort, uh, the Anat of Yahu, uh, the consort to, to, to the Judean god. Uh, and we have other, uh, other deities named as well. We have Judeans naming their children with theophoric elements. So, you know, names of, of divinities that are included in the name. Uh, a theophoric element in the name would be like, my name, uh, Yonatan, is Yonatan. The, the Judean uh, god, Yud Vav, gave, right? It's, by the way, Netanyahu is uh, the same name, just backwards. Um, so we have these theophoric elements of foreign deities, as well as the Judean uh, deity. So, so clearly, when we're in the fifth century before the common era, which is when the Elephantine uh, documents date to, we have, at least in Elephantine, Judeans revering foreign gods, uh, also taking oaths by, by the names of foreign gods, along with uh, the Judean god. We have a similar situation in Babylonia, where we have Judeans taking oaths by, by foreign gods. And in, uh, when I say Babylonia, by the way, the evidence comes from uh, cuneiform tablets from two sites, a site called Al Yahudu, uh, and we also have a, the, the Murashu archive. So these are two archives. Murashu is a little bit later than the Al Yahudu archive, uh, but again, date to the sixth and fifth centuries before the Common Era. Similar situation. In Judea, we actually have less evidence in terms of, of, of in general, uh, textual evidence for sure, epigraphic evidence, written, written documents that have survived from, from Judea. What we do have in Judea are coins. And on these coins, we have uh, art, right, depictions of foreign goddesses. So we have, for example, Athena on uh, silver coins that were minted in Judea. Athena's owl, the attribute of Athena, uh, the owl, which we find on uh, Judean coins. Not only do we find this on Judean coins, we find Judean coins with the names of Judean governors like Hezekiah. And there's also a, a Judean high priest named Yohanan which has on it the Owl of Athena, right? So we have the, the name Yohanan HaKohen, uh, Yohanan the priest, and in the middle of it has uh, the attribute of Athena, the, the, uh, the Athenian Owl. Now, these coins, to be fair, are copies of Athenian coins. They're copies of coins that were minted in Athens. They're minted in Judea by Judeans, and the Judeans copied these, uh, these uh, motifs but they're certainly um pagan as far you know polytheistic let's put it that way uh and w w which is super interesting so certainly there is no evidence that judeans at this time in the persian period up until uh, the conquest of alexander the great in let's say 332 bc there's no evidence that they were worshiping only the Judean God in any kind of monotheistic or uh, monotheist kind of way. There's no evidence for that in, in this early period. Before the Pentateuch became a very popular and popularly read book in, uh, uh, in the second century BC, first century BC era, where do you think this text might have been circulating? before it became widely popular? So I don't know, right? I, 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 I don't know. We don't have evidence for this. We can only imagine. Um, so 
again, when, when it was written, I don't know. After it was written and edited and so on, we don't know. We don't know if I can give you, you know, two ends of the spectrum. One end of the spectrum is that it was sitting on a shelf gathering dust. Nobody looked at it for decades, centuries. It's a possibility. Um, you know, as long as the as long as the the physical copy of the book was able to survive enough time it, until it could be copied again, th that's certainly a possibility. Another possibility is that it was, as you said, circulating amongst a small group of people. So again, it's easy to imagine that there might have been some small group of people that, you know, were, were reading this text, perhaps even putting it into practice. Certainly it's a possibility. Uh, the, the, the issue is that we don't have evidence for, for any of this. We, we simply don't know. And I don't see much reason to conjecture in, in either direction as long as we don't have evidence. Now, I should point out that we do have a translation of the Pentateuch into Greek called the Septuagint. And there are scholars that would like to date the Septuagint to the third century before the Common Era on the basis, I think the strongest evidence is, is linguistic uh, uh, based. Um, I can't weigh in on that because I <laughs> my Greek is not good enough to be able to to tell you that the Greek of the Septuagint is specifically third century BC and not second century BC. Um, you know, how scholars are able to get to, to that determination, I don't know. But as far as I can tell, that's the, the best evidence that they have for, for dating the Septuagint that early. Aside from this, the, 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 the mythical story that we find in the letter of Aristeus that, the, that uh, Ptolemy II had the Septuagint, this is, this is a mythical story. There's no reason to think that, that, that anything of the sort actually happened. Um, but let's say that the Septuagint was translated in the second century, in, excuse me, in the third century before the Common Era. Okay, what does that mean? What kind of distribution did the Pentateuch have at this time? I don't know. All you need is one copy to be sitting in, in Hebrew, to be sitting in front of a, of a, of a translator, and, and you can have a translation. So it, I don't think that the, the fact that the Septuagint was translated necessarily implies any kind of wide-scale circulation. So to answer your question very simply, I don't know. I don't know how widely the, the Pentateuch was, was circulating, if it was circulating at all, prior to the second century before the common era when we, we we suddenly have evidence that it was widely circulated i want to uh return to the elephantine uh, elephantine papari for a minute um some would look at this text as okay you got you got what appears to be an earlier version of the jewish god in there being mentioned as having this apparently this consort on not yahoo and some look at this and, and they have the opinion that this is some kind of evidence of early syncretism between could be early syncretism between the an earlier version of the jewish god possibly with a canaanite god or having been originally a canaanite deity even what what are your thoughts on this if you have any Okay, so so the the question of when um, you know when this this notion of of Yahweh of of the Judean God Israelite God uh, first appears, uh, how far back it goes? Does it predate any kind of Israelite identity, any kind of Judean identity? Uh, th these are certainly interesting questions, fascinating questions, uh, as far as I can tell. Uh, they're they're not questions that I deal with, because again. It's there, there absolutely we know there was a Judean uh, group, a group of people who self identified as Judeans, as Yehudim in Aramaic, Yehudaye, right? Uh, in, uh, in Greek, as Yudaioi, right? This group of people existed for a long time. They existed, our earliest evidence 
uh, is from the eighth century before the Common Era. We have in Assyrian uh, documents, uh, Hezekiah the Judean is, is mentioned in, by, by, in Sennacherib's uh, uh, in texts from the time of Sennacherib. There definitely were people who identified and were identified, self-identified and were identified by others as Judeans. These Judeans worshipped a god uh, na na with, who, that was named Yahweh, right? yud Hey vav Hey. We have no doubt about this. We have people naming themselves, their children, uh, using theophoric elements from this name. There's no doubt about that. And, and we have the name written out in, uh, in texts from, uh, from this early time and, and from earlier periods as well. There's no doubt about this. That's not a question that I'm looking at in this book because this goes back a long time. This does not assume that we have a Torah. This does not assume that even if there was a Torah, that it was widely uh, known and, and, and practiced, right? So these are, these are separate issues. I think that people get confused because today, when we speak of Judaism, all of these things are implied, right? We assume that if you have somebody practicing Judaism, that they identify as a Jew and that they are, you know, if they're practicing Judaism, they're keeping the laws of the Torah in, in, in their practice of Judaism so in one way or another, right? And we assume that it's a religion, right? We call this a religion like we have, you know, we the same semantic category that we have for Christians, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, Jews, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, uh, Tao, you know, wh whatever it is. These we all call religions. All right, but this is a very modern notion that we can take all of these, um, all of these things and put them under one category, which we call religion. This is not what I'm looking at, right? So I'm not looking at modern day Judaism. I'm looking at the laws of when one of the laws of the Torah being practiced by ordinary people, and we and, and that the earliest evidence for that come comes much later than the early earliest evidence we have for Judeans or the Judean God. These are these are separate issues. So when do you think that, at least in terms of maybe maybe not precisely when, but the the time period um, that it certainly happened by that the Samaritans and the Jews broke up into two separate groups. Okay, so that's also an interesting question. We have uh, certainly went in the Persian period already. Samaria and Judea are separate provinces. Uh, so, you know, we, we have this distinction between people that are living in Samaria, people that are living in Judea. Uh, the people living in Samaria don't seem to be identifying as Judeans. And, you know, Judeans, that, 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 that's a, an identity group. Samaritans seem to be a separate identity group. An interesting question is, we know that eventually the Samaritans did adopt the Torah and did practice the, the, the laws of the Torah, as did the Judeans. And in fact, that is the case uh, until today, right? So we have today Samaritans not many unfortunately we have i think less than a thousand uh, surviving samaritans today but they have a pentateuch very similar to ours you know very similar to the uh to the jewish uh, pentateuch jewish christian pentateuch very similar and the question is when did samaritans adopt the pentateuch as their torah and Scholars often think that it was earlier than the second century before the common era, but again, we have no evidence for that. And in the book, what I suggest is that very possibly what happened was we know that the Samaritans were conquered by the Hasmoneans in towards the end of the second century before the common era. So let's say uh, the, the last decade or, or the last what the last two decades before uh, before 100 BCE. And the Hasmoneans destroyed the uh, Samaritan uh, temple uh, on Mount Gerizim. It's, it seems to me quite likely 
that what happened was when the Samaritans came and conquered the, the Samaritans, excuse me, when the Hasmoneans came and conquered the Samaritans, they brought the Torah to the Samaritans. Why do I think that, that that might very well be the case? We have evidence from written sources that when the Hasmoneans conquered the Edomians, which is another neighbor to the south of, of, of Judea, they did exactly that. They enforced the rules of the Torah on the Edomians. They forced them to circumcise and they forced them to keep the laws of the Torah. We know that when the Hasmoneans, uh, so this was John Hyrcanus, the same uh, the same Hasmonean ruler that conquered the Edomians also conquered the Samaritans. So I don't think it's unlikely that if the Hasmoneans did this to the Samar to the Edomians in the south, that they wouldn't have done something similar to the Samaritans in the north. John Hyrcanus's son, Aristobulus I, conquered a northern tribe in, in Galilee called the Eturians. And he is said to have done the same thing with them, to enforce the laws of the Torah on the Eturians, force them to keep to keep the rules of the Torah. Today we would call that forced conversion, right? He forced them to convert to Judaism. But the terms that are used in the ancient sources are that uh, he forced them to circumcise and to keep the laws, uh, the, 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 uh, the customs of the fathers, I believe that, that's the term. I don't think it's unreasonable to think that the same thing happened with the Samaritans and that, in fact, that is the source of the Samaritans' uh, adoption of the Torah as as their own uh, as as their own Samaritanism, right? as, as opposed to Judaism. This is when the the Samaritans, I, I think, it's quite likely, began to keep the laws of the Torah themselves. And as for the uh, the, sect, the the different uh, sectarian movements, when do you think that? Let me rephrase that. What is the earliest evidence that we have for the Essenes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Right. So, so scholars think that the the the, the sectarian um, the sectarian movements that we have, right, the various sects that we have from the late Second Temple period, probably split off sometime during the Hasmonean period, probably in the, the second century before the Common Era. I think that this is quite telling. That we have the the sects splitting specifically at this time we have to remember that the pentateuch is a very opaque text right it's essentially impossible to keep the rules of the pentateuch without interpreting them so interpretation is an incredibly important uh element in judaism we, we cannot have judaism without interpretation now you put two jews into a room put two people into a room Give them a text, tell them interpret this text. You're going to have three different opinions. Right? That's that's the joke. You put two Jews into a room, you give them a, a a Torah to interpret or whatever it is. You know, ask them their opinion about something. You're going to have three different opinions. Why is that? Because we're human beings and we interpret things differently because we have different experiences and we have different makeups and and you know we 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 grew up in different homes and so on and so forth we, we think differently because we're different people and as such it is essentially impossible to have judaism without having disagreements you cannot have judaism without where where, where which is based on the notion that the torah the pentateuch is the base text which needs to be interpreted and not have arguments about it. So the fact that the sects appear to appear, right, emerge in the second century before the Common Era, I think is quite suggestive of the idea that the Torah only became well known and 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 regarded as authoritative sometime around then, right? So so what I'm imagining here is that the Torah becomes authoritative and the sects start to argue about, okay, how do we interpret this? And then, and then we have the sects splitting. I, I, I think that the Hasmoneans here very well may have played an important role. Um, so, so I mentioned that the Hasmoneans are going around conquering Edomians, conquering the Samaritans, conquering the Eturians, enforcing the rules of the Torah on them. This we know happened. I don't think it's much of a stretch 
to think that this, the uh, Hasmoneans did the same thing with the Judeans themselves. So, you know, per perhaps in the same generation, perhaps a generation or two before, um, sometime in the middle of the second century before the Common Era, it seems to me quite likely that it was the Hasmoneans themselves, this ruling family, by the way, a priestly family, that decided to adopt the Pentateuch as the written law, the, the official law of this newly independent nation. So, you know, we have this, the, the, the Maccabean revolt, we have a newly independent state, this Judean state, which, you know, for the first time since the Iron Age, we have an independent Judean state. The Hasmoneans that are ruling the state needed something to, 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 to bind the Jude Judeans together and the people that they had conquered all the various nations that they had conquered into one, one unit, right? One political uh, unit, a unified uh, group. And the Pentateuch, uh, I suggest, may very well have been that thing which, which would have unified all of these people, right? I, in the book, I, I, I say that the Pentateuch might have been used as a, uh, a sort of, like we have in the United States, a, const a, a declaration of independence and a constitution, right? The dec because the Pentateuch isn't only laws, it's also the founding uh, story of, of, of the Israelites, right? How the Israelites came about, the, the patriarchs, uh, the, the sojourn in Egypt, the exodus, and so on and so forth. And then we have the laws. So I, I think it's somewhat akin to a declaration of independence, right? The, the, the origin story of, of the Israelites and amalgamated with that, uh, a constitution, right? So the Judean constitution would have, would, would have been the laws uh, that we find in the Pentateuch. So I, I, I think that the, 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 the place of the, of, of the Hasmoneans here uh, could very well be, be critical. Just want to return real quick uh, to, the, uh, to the practices. What is the earliest evidence that we have for the practice of the Sabbath? So again, second century before the common era, no earlier. So again, the methodology that I that I use in the book is that I start with the first century of, of the common era. A ton of evidence we have for, for, for Sabbath observance. Unfortunately, we don't really have archaeological evidence because Sabbath observance just isn't something which leaves material traces. Um, but, you know, authors, both Judean authors, non-Judean authors are attesting to Judean widespread observance of prohibitions on the Sabbath. And of course, there's arguments about exactly what that means, what's allowed, what's not allowed. We find in the Gospels, uh, Jesus arguing with uh, his interlocutor, inter, interlocutors uh, about what, you know, what is allowed on the Sabbath, what's not allowed. Judeans were arguing about this, but this is going on in the first century of the Common Era. We find evidence for this also in the first century before the Common Era. Uh, we have, you know, cities in the Eastern Mediterranean which are allowing their uh, their Judean citizens uh, to not to 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 join the army uh, because they can't keep the Sabbath properly uh, in the army, um, and, and assorted evidence from this early period, also the second century before the Common Era. We have stories from uh, one and two Maccabees about Judeans giving their lives and not to fight on the Sabbath. The earliest evidence that we have of this sort is from the second century before the common era. There's nothing from earlier periods which indicate that Judeans were abstaining from this or that kind of uh, work, any kind of prohibitions that Judeans are keeping on the Sabbath, we don't have before the second century BC. Now, the term Sabbath appears in uh, biblical texts outside of the Pentateuch, which seem to predate the second century BC. But first of all, there's no reason to think that in almost all of these texts, there's no reason to think that we're talking about a, a, uh, a Sabbath, which occurs one day every, out of every seven, right on Saturday, let's say. We don't have any indication, in fact, from the Hebrew Bible outside of the Pentateuch that there was a seven-day week. 
There's one verse in Ezekiel, uh, but aside from that and the Pentateuch, there's no evidence that Judeans at large were keeping a seven day week at all. And there's also no evidence that they were keeping prohibitions of any sort uh, on the Sabbath. Now, what this early Sabbath might have been, scholars uh, debate. There are some scholars that think that this might have been a monthly a holiday of some sort. Uh, but what, what, what's important for, for my purposes is that there's no reason to think that any kind of Pentateuchal Sabbath, where you have it occurring one day a week with prohibitions, there's no reason, th there's no evidence for this uh, prior to the second century BC. There's no evidence that this was widely uh, observed. Well, thanks for joining me today, Professor Adler. It's been a pleasure. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron and or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.